you ever been afraid of monsters under the bed? That was me. I was there. If you were listening to the Krista program on PhoneZoo, come to Spreaker.com, listen live, and join in the chat. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chris Top. First off, I want to thank you for tuning in to the Chris Top program. While I try my best to keep the show as rated PG-13 as possible, sometimes things slip out, or sometimes things happen, and that's just the way live radio goes. And because this is the internet, the FCC isn't around to tell me what I can and can't do. So because of the occasional slip-up or the guest that might get out of hand, you really need to be 18 or older to listen. If you happen to be under 18, please make sure you get your parents' permission. You know, normally I play the intro here, but I just wanted to get on here real quick, and I wanted to thank everybody for tuning in. I know it's Halloween. Maybe you're just a loser like me, and you don't have a life. Maybe you're, maybe you decided not to go out and dress up like a slut today, or <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what your reasons are for being here, but I'm really happy you're here, and thank you. Thank you. Portions of the day's programming are reproduced by means of electrical transcriptions or tape recordings. <laughs> you can either talk in the Christoph program. I am the one and only Christoph. <laughs> you can either talk in the Christoph program. Broadcasting live from my lavish studio apartment. The busy are and the divvy did the was and that of that flat back in 19. We didn't know about the world wide web was a whole different game Band played back when I was a kid Wanna get down in a cool way Picture yourself on a beautiful day Big bell bottoms in pool of long hair Just walking in style with a part of an MP3 play You can listen to the music on the Christmas program program. I met him 15 years ago. I was told there was nothing left. No reason, uh, no conscience, no understanding, any of the most rudimentary sense of life or death, of good or evil, right and wrong. I met this six-year-old child with this blind, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him, and then another seven trying to keep him locked up, because I realized what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. Hello world, I am the one and only Chris Top, broadcasting live from my lavish studio apartment here in sunny Clarksville, Tennessee with an ocean view. You know, it just doesn't work as well after the Freddy, uh, Freddy theme as opposed to the, the Chris Top theme. But I tried, and it's Halloween. Uh, I've got a lot of Halloween stories for you on the way. It's going to be a lot of fun. I put hours and hours of work into these little few minute long segments. It's insane. And you thought I was doing nothing this month. I actually have been really busy. And it's going to be a relatively short show today just because I have to get up early in the morning. I am insanely busy. Like, think think really busy, and then it's busier than that, if that explains anything. Now, I'm going to talk um, about something d other than Halloween just for a second. Because this has made the dork news. Now, if, if you don't know by now, well, you should know by now that Lucas sold his stuff. Yeah, George Lucas, that Lucas, he sold it to Disney for $4 billion. That's billion with a B. 
and they're making another Star Wars. See, now that's where it starts getting scary. Because they've already screwed the story up in the last three, right? Am I right? Am I right? But they've already planned the release for 2015. And, and there's going to be more to follow. <sighs> Princess Leia and the Seven Dwarfs. It's going to suck. But I'm still going to go watch them, just because I'm a fan. <laughs> So our 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 childhood treasure is is going to be officially gone now. Just just no more Jar Jar Binks, please, please no more Jar Jar Binks. Now this is a real life kind of a scary thing. Do you hate rats? I despise rats and snakes and stuff like that. But we're talking about rats. New York City survived Hurricane Sandy, but now it's up against rats. With four of seven subway tunnels flooded, it's feared that the still-living underground rats will swim. They could be zombie rats. Has anybody ever thought of that? They'll swim, they'll float, or they'll scamper above ground into the New York City streets. While much of the city's 28 million rat population... And see, we worry if we see a little mouse. At least you don't have 28 million rats in your, in your apartment. I've got Abby, so I'm not worried. But anyway, a lot of them weren't killed by the flooding. A few survived, and they could actually turn to scavenging during broad daylight. See, it sounds to me like zombies. The flood didn't kill them. They're out in the middle of the day looking for food. They're zombie rats. Don't kid yourself. But anyway, they're bringing their disease-ridden fur and urine with them. The number that will head for the surface will largely depend on how fast the city can pump water out of the tunnels and repair workers can expect a grizzly rodent body count waiting below the streets. Isn't that gross? I thought that was a good Halloween story. If I sound like I'm talking funny, I am. Because I've got um, these little pieces of peanuts that are stuck in my mouth because I was eating peanuts while I was playing all that stuff for you. And I'm going to eat more peanuts because I've got a lot of stuff, to, a lot of audio <laughs> to play for you um, today. But that's why I'm sounding funny, because I keep spitting peanuts out of my mouth when I talk. I'm glad you're not here watching me, because you'd be going, Ooh, ooh, I see why this is the Halloween special. Gross! But I would like to welcome everyone to the chat. We have the lovely Vivacious Kiss in the chat. Kiss, it's wonderful and a pleasure to see you. We also have Love Muffin, a.k.a. Jin. We have my sister from another mister, Miss Kimberly Top. And I know I saw, oh, there's Mr. Brent Bradley. Brent, how are you? Now, Brent, I would have played one of your covers today had you covered the zombie song by Stephanie Maybe. Or maybe the number one Halloween song of all time. And what do you guys think that is? The number one Halloween song of all time. We're going to play that in just a little while because that's going to be our, our Billboard number one song of the week. And it's going to be a Halloween song. But it's going to be a cover of the song. But nonetheless, it's, it's the song. I don't even know what you guys are talking about now. See, I get, see I've only been here a second, and, and, and you guys are already confusing me. But now we've got Scooter in the chat. Scooter, it's good to see you. Long time no see, but I haven't been around that much this month either. Have I even done a, sh a live show this month? I think maybe I might have done one or two, and then I did some recordings. Uh, speaking of recordings, if you haven't heard any of the, any of the uh, recordings yet, I'm actually quite impressed with myself. Now, this is what I'm hoping. I'm hoping you'll turn the lights out. You'll just walk away from the keyboard. Maybe you'll sit there with your family. Just just enjoy these stories. I'm, I'm not going to play them all back to back, but uh, but that's the majority of the show today. Just some stories that I worked on and uh, and produced. It's a, it's an original Chris Top production. And you see, that's that's what I strive to do on here. I, I, I try to be as original as I can because a lot of the shows that, that you get that are out there, they're just, it's just reprocessed stuff is all it is. And, uh, and I try to be original. Uh, well, these aren't stories that I wrote, but I'm telling them. I didn't just, you know, rip it off of some place and, and play it for you. So I try to, try to be as original as I can. But anyway, enough of that. Should we... No, it's too early for that. It's too... See, I'm arguing with myself. Sometimes I, I, I really think I'm a schizophrenic. I really do. Oh, 
Oh, thank goodness. Phew, it's just you, Lady Gaga. <laughs> Now, I was going to go from right from that into the story, but I just want to say hey real quick to my good buddy Ray. Thanks for stopping by. Don't know why I can't ever find a cigarette when I really need one. <laughs> oh, here we, here we go. Whew. She was, uh, she was beautiful. She really was. She... She worked in a box factory, and her salary was not large. She made just enough to cover the cost of food, shelter, and the clothes on her back. So when, uh, <clears throat> so when she received an invitation to a fancy dress party from an old friend, she did not know what she should do. Here was her one chance to at last shine a little to experience how the other half lived, but she had no money to buy a dress or even the material to make one. She mentioned her dilemma to a woman at the box factory. Why not run a costume, is what the woman suggested. It shouldn't cost much just for one evening. Try your local pawn shop. <laughs> Try your local pawn shop. So she made her way to a pawn shop near her home after work. At the rear of the store, she found this beautiful satin gown, complete with matching accessories. The owner of the shop was willing to rent the gown to her for a very reasonable fee. After paying the fee, she took the beautiful gown home with her on the night of the party. She dressed very carefully for the occasion and peered at her reflection in the tiny mirror in her bathroom. She looked radiant, her blue eyes glowing with the excitement of an evening out. As she turned away from the mirror, she thought she heard a ghostly voice whisper, Give me back my dress. She froze in the doorway, looking around uncertainly for the speaker, but she saw no one. She shrugged, went downstairs, and splurged on a cab fare to, to Manhattan. When she arrived, she was surrounded by so many men just wanting one dance with her. She felt like Cinderella at the ball and the first hour of the party had quickly slipped away. She... Oh, hang on. She slowly became aware of growing nausea when she paused between dances. She felt lightheaded and the room was spinning. For a moment, she heard a ghostly whisper in her ear. Again, it said... Give me back my dress. She tried to smile into the faces of her partners, but finally the nausea had overwhelmed her. She gave an excuse to the man that she was dancing with and she slipped away. She made her way to the street and managed to summon a cab to take her home. She staggered into the building and crawled up the steps to her flat. Her beautiful hands, they were, they were trembling as she unlocked the door. She fell through the door frame and she stumbled, she stumbled brokenly to her bed. For the third and final time, she heard the ghostly voice whisper once again, Give me back my dress. You have taken this from me, and I want it back. <clears throat> the, uh, the young woman was found dead the next day in the autopsy. Report stated that the young woman had been poisoned by embalming fluid, which had entered her through her through her pores. The <clears throat> the authorities they they found the receipt, which led them right to me, the pawnbroker. They questioned me. 
and I told them that the dress that had uh, that had actually killed the young woman beautiful girl it had been removed from the body of a dead girl just before her casket was nailed shut and buried in the local graveyard this has been a Chris Top production <laughs> You can need a tap in the Chris Top program. Mr. Pop. All right, much more stuff on the way uh, here on the Chris Top program. But first, the number one Halloween song of all time, as if you hadn't guessed it. And no, it's mo- it's not Monster Mash, if that's what you were thinking. And this is the number one Halloween song, according to Billboard. Radio is full of top 40 countdowns, but who needs all that when you can go straight to the top? <laughs> Here's the hottest cover of this week's number one song. It's close to me.
PRT Paranormal Talk, your source for everything paranormal. PRT Paranormal Talk. Talk is now on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights here on Spreaker.com and on Euron.net. Check out www.prtparanormaltalk.weebly.com for upcoming shows and much more. Once again, that is www.prtparanormaltalk.weebly.com. I'm calling access. all dorks. Calling all dorks. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be cool? How it feels like to actually talk to chicks and not be ignored? Then you need to tune in every Monday night at 10 p.m. Eastern Time and listen to The Rob Aguilar Show, where we're going to talk about sex. That's right. Sex. I know you guys think about that, what it feels like to actually have sex with someone. We're going to talk about sports, women, entertainment, All the things you've been wondering about. So tune in every Monday night, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, and listen to The Rob Aguilar Show. Hello, I'm Chris Crash Jesus Taylor from HTLA Radio 1 at HTLA973.com. You know, a few weeks back, I happened upon the Chris Top program on Spreaker.com. And I was met with feelings and love I had never before experienced with a radio show and a host of hosts. The joy and inspiration you brought to my life, Chris, with just a few simple words. The inspirational clips, the chat banter, the total hotties that you as a dork attract and maintain without effort. The king of all dorks, you proclaim, and so it is true. Chris Top, my lord, my king. I love you. When I was thirsty, you gave me Mountain Dew. When I was hungry, you fed me Muse. When I was nervous, you helped me pee. Now, from the rooftops, I shout Wabo with glee. So please join me with the chat dorks every day for another dose of the Chris Top program on Spreaker.com. leaving this message in case I don't make it out alive. I am second in command of Potato Salad Special Forces, and I'm the only one left. Most of the men gave up when they found the zombie spuds went viral and found their way into bags and bags of Lay's potato chips. Oh no, they found a way in. This is worse than the potato famine. You're not going to take me without a fight. I'm going to mash your potato, you son of a spud. You turned Mr. Potato Head. I know now it is my destiny to save all of potato manatee. I'm going to spill every last drop of your potato soup, you dirty zombie tater tot from hell. You dirty zombie tater tot from hell. I was going to say something. I don't remember what it was. Uh, But again, I want to thank everybody for being here today. What was I going to... I was going to talk about something. I knew what it was like two seconds ago. And then I just... I just... I freaking forgot. It'll come to me. It always does. It could be like tomorrow. So you'll never know what I was talking about. Uh, But in the meantime, uh, we're going to talk about zombies for a second. Well, I've got a zombie story for you. <clears throat> and speaking of zombies, they're also known as walkers, if you're a big Walking Dead fan. And I'm not going to give any any spoilers on this show, but I, I do want to say this. I love Rick's attitude this season. I love the way he treats Lori. He don't take no crap from her now, and she knows her place. <laughs> It makes me feel good. Now, if a if a zombie baby would just burst out of her stomach and start eating people's faces off, that would be cool. Would be really cool. <clears throat> what was it uh, she she said the other day? He he was he was having a, an internal dilemma on whether or not he should kill a, a human being. There were you know the prisoners that were in the prison that they were breaking into. And if you don't know, if you don't watch the show, I know you're totally lost. I get that. But he was having a dilemma on whether or not he should kill another man. And Laurie says, well, I know you're not a killer, so do what you have to do. And Rick's like, yeah, yeah, you say that now, but then later you're just going to be a bitch. (laughs) That's what he was thinking the whole time in his head. You know, that's exactly what he was thinking. You're listening to the Chris Top program. You're absolutely, positively in the right place. I had to do a zombie one. I just, I had to. Because I'm, I'm, I love zombies. I, I don't know what it is about them. But uh, this one's actually called Little Town on the Plain. (laughs) 
Bats are filtering in from all across the nation. The dead are rising from their graves and seeking out the living with ravenous desire. These ghoulish creatures have infested the city in search of living human prey. The quarantines have been breached. As the world collapsed around us, our little town drew closer together. We established early on that we faced a situation of unimaginable suffering and destruction if we were unprepared. So we stored food, we stored fuel, we stored weapons and other supplies. We built large walls around the town, originally made of wood, but over time we reinforced them with concrete and steel. Other towns laughed at our efforts. They said it would all blow over in a couple of weeks. They were wrong. We reminded them that it may still blow over as they arrived at our doorstep begging for shelter. Those who we took in were made to work in the fields or face eviction from the town. A full week after the first evacuees arrived, we saw our first undead. The damn thing chased a big old buck through the forest, and as it stepped out from the tree line and saw one of the guards, it turned and made its way toward it. At the sound of rapid gunshots, we ran to his aid, finding the man gibbering in terror, cut, covered in blood, and now a dead zombie at his feet with 15 bullets in it. Our biggest mistake was not executing the guard there and then. It sounds harsh, but that mistake caused the lives of 10 residents. It was also our first exposure to how quickly a zombie infection can spread, how truly dangerous it really is, and how overwhelming and forced the response has to be. Life is harsh, but we survive, and that is all that's important anymore. This has been a Chris Top production. <laughs> you can need a tap in the Chris Top program. Okay, now this next one has got to be one of my favorites. I want you to I want you to listen to this one because I I didn't want to be all serious, scary on all of them. And Kim see, Kim said I sounded like Billy Ray Cyrus on that one. I don't think I did. I did find my inner mullet though for that now that you mention it uh but anyway the uh the next one uh, sort of takes a step back and it's sort of a, of a dark humor but it's called the bank teller i put all of my silver coins into a money box so that when it's full and i'm poor i can exchange it at the bank for clean crisp notes when full i know that it holds between 70 and 100 dollars depending on the breakdown of the denominations inside. One particular time the money box was full. I arrived at the bank and waited patiently in line. Finally, it was my turn at the window. I handed over the coins to the bank teller and waited while he put them through the machine, which counts coins. When the machine was finished, he came back to the window. $1,105 is what he told me, very matter-of-factly. Surely this was a mistake. I inquired of him if this was correct. It most certainly was, is what he assured me. Already my mind was thinking. This bank teller had obviously made a mistake, but how could I profit from it? I formulated a plan. I figured if I were to take some of the money in cash and deposit the rest in my account, as I normally do, the bank could realize the bank teller's mistake and withdraw the excess money from my account. I decided to take all of the money in cash, thus leaving no paper trail as I would not have to give any of my account details. Then I would give some money to a relative who would then deposit it back into my account as though it were a gift. Flawless, or so I thought. I'll take it in cash, I informed the bank teller only to be told that they did not have that much there. You don't have that much there. No, 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 no. A bank with no money? That's preposterous. Especially since I could see a drawer filled with $150 notes behind him. What about that? And then I pointed to the drawer. He said, I'm sorry, I can't use that. What was going on here? Was this some sort of conspiracy to test my honesty? 
Surely I'd already failed. Sweat began to beat on my forehead as I pondered the next step. I couldn't take my silver back and take it to another bank. It was already in the bank system. The teller continued to stare at me. What would Sir like to do? He asked me again. I didn't say it, but when I looked at him, my eyes said shut up. I couldn't see any other option. I was trapped between the proverbial rock and the hard place. I pulled out the gun from my waistband and calmly fired one shot into his skull. What a shit day. This has been a Chris Top production. See, that just that, that was one of my favorites. That one made me laugh when I read it, so I had to do that one. More Halloween stories on the way. Before we take a break, I want you to take just a minute and spread that Spreaker love. If you have a show here on Spreaker, make sure you type the word show into the chat and give each other a follow. Listen to the show at least one time. If you don't like it, you don't have to listen again. But if you do, then congratulations. You found something new and interesting. We're just here to spread that love all Top's only competition is Chris Top in constant pursuit of being awesome. observation. Most people play these types of songs only this time of the year. I, I play this stuff all year long. I do. What's my problem?
Come listen to The Views Expressed on the Liberty and Freedom Network. The Views Expressed, Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Pacific, only on the Liberty and Freedom Network. For more information, contact them at libertyandfreedomnetwork at usa.com. The free COO is on the air. Rock and roll! It's always a good idea to have a free COO in your pocket. And I'm not talking about the latest iPhone app. I'm talking about the free COO on Spreaker.com. Join Don, Francesco, and RC as they Spreak the truth on what it takes to build and run your startup company. The free COO. Hello, dorks of the world, and waba to all. That zombie apocalypse is quickly approaching, kiddies. Right this minute is the best time to look for the closest dork safe house. Why don't we ask little emo Timmy where he's going to go when the zombies come a-knocking? Oh, wait, look at that zombie go. Eating what few brains little emo Timmy had left in his head. Remember, be a dork, be proud, be hip, and waba. And welcome back to the program, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome Garrett to the chat. And we also have Clinton for the love of poetry and spoken word in here. And Clinton, it's always good to see you. Hey, Clinton, you might enjoy the show today. I don't know. I'm Well, it's me, though. Uh, we're doing Halloween stories and uh, other various Halloween things. I, don't, I just did my favorite one. You just missed it. But you'll have to go back and check it out. <laughs> I've got uh, what, one, two, three more, and I may do four more. Uh, Halloween stories, not absolutely sure yet. This one is called Eye of the Beholder. When you've been trapped in here as long as I have, you've got to be creative in finding ways to entertain yourself. We used to have books, but those are gone now. Banned since a guy upstairs found a way to use the Bible to kill himself. Probably got paper cut to death. Anyway, it wouldn't and shouldn't make a difference in my case because, for one, I'm not a depressed psycho. And for two, I can't kill myself no matter how hard I try. I suppose that alone time has given me ways to cure my boredom. First time I stabbed myself was with a fork in the dining hall. The guy next to me screamed. Guards came running, thought I'd attacked him, and by the time they called the doctor, I was all better. They locked each of us in our own confinements that night. Pretty soon, a guy from Block B came up to me in the yard telling me how to fashion a knife from a spoon. Thought I'd try it. Worked pretty well. Only wish I had a camera to take pictures. See, the way the blood snaked down my leg, it looked beautiful going down the drain, too. But best of all, on the cement floor, all dried up in patterns. I got into painting. I painted a tree, an eye, and a woman. She was my best piece of work. I named her Ruby. By now, the boys and guards figured out what I was. My knife was well hidden, so I don't have to worry. Guards would walk by and spit on the ground at my feet. Freak, they'd say. I'd laugh. Maybe peel the skin off of my finger to expose my knuckle. Then I'd break it off and throw it on the floor at their feet. I'd watch them flinch at the noise, trying to keep it tough. They're right. I am a freak. Not because I can heal, but because I can see the beauty in pain. This has been a Chris Top production. You know, Kim actually brings up a good point. She says, uh, why do you need to make a knife out of a spoon? Just get a knife. And that's some great advice for uh, anyone out there in the world that's trying to to get by. <laughs> in, in case you just tuned in, you're listening to the Chris Top program. It's the Halloween special today, and these are all ghost stories as told by Mr. Top. These are the way I interpret them. Uh, so... Yeah, I don't know. See, I don't like to just rip stuff off and play it on my show. I, I like to do it myself and, and put sound effects in. It, it, it's part of the fun. And I know that most of these are only just a few minutes long, but holy crap, it took me hours to do this. Maybe I'm just not good at it. Uh, I like to think I'm, I'm somewhat of a perfectionist, but uh, I, I'm probably just not that good at it. Axe Murder Hollow is the name of this one.
Susan and Ned were driving through a wooded empty section of highway. Lightning flashed, thunder roared, the sky went dark in the torrential downpour. We'd better stop, said Susan. Ned nodded his head in agreement. He stepped on the brake and suddenly the car started to slide on the slick pavement. They plunged off the road and slid to a halt at the bottom of an incline. Pale and shaking, Ned quickly turned to check to see if Susan was okay. When she nodded, Ned relaxed and looked through the rain-soaked windows. I'm going to see how bad it is, he told Susan, and went out into the storm. She saw his blurry figure in the headlight, walking around the front of the car. A moment later, he jumped in beside her, soaking wet. The car is not badly damaged, but we're well deep in mud, he said. I'm going to have to go for help. Susan swallowed nervously. There would be no quick rescue here. He told her to turn off the headlights and lock the door until he returned. Axe Murder Hollow. Although Ned hadn't said the name aloud, they both knew what he had been thinking when he told her to lock the car. This was a place where a man had once taken an axe and hacked his wife to death in a jealous rage over an alleged affair. Supposedly, the axe-wielding spirit of the husband continued to haunt this section of the road. Outside the car, Susan heard a shriek, a loud thump, and a strange gurgling noise but she couldn't see anything in the darkness. Frightened, she shrank down into her seat. She sat in silence for a while, and then she noticed another sound. It was a soft sound, like something being blown by the wind. Suddenly, the car was illuminated by a light. An official-sounding voice told her to get out of the car. Ned must have found the police officer. Susan unlocked the door and stepped out of the car. As her eyes adjusted to the bright light, she saw it. Hanging by his feet from the tree next to the car was the dead body of Ned. His bloody throat had been cut so deeply that his head was nearly decapitated. The wind swung his corpse back and forth so it thumped against the tree. Susan screamed and ran toward the voice in the light. As she drew close, she realized the light was not coming from a flashlight. Standing there was the glowing figure of a man with a smile on his face and a large, solid, and definitely real axe in his hands. She backed away from the glowing figure until she bumped into the car. <laughs> Playing around when my back was turned? The ghost whispered, stroking the sharp blade of the axe with his fingers. You've been very naughty. The last thing she saw was the glint of the axe blade in the eerie, incandescent light. has been a Chris Top production. See, I thought that one was actually wonderfully produced. I don't know. See, I noticed these things, though. Uh, well, because I, I did it. Uh, but anyway, you're listening to the Chris Top program. Today, my friends, is Halloween 2012. There's one more story on the way, possibly two, but that's up to you, uh, here in just a little while. So go go to the bathroom real quick, or you can sit here and listen to my ad, whatever you want to do. Of course, it would help if I turned my ad up and then played it. So you know now. Of course. Do you think he's coming back? I don't know. I'm Sprinkles Reckoning. Mr. Todd. Why didn't you just kill me? Your punishment must be more severe. When you speak up, it's ashes. You have my permission to die. Let the games begin. <laughs> you can either the crystal Okay, now this has got to be the greatest zombie song of all time. Stephanie Maybe, the zombie song. Right here on the Chris Top program, ladies and gentlemen. It's a Halloween special. Our love story could be kind of gory, far from boring. We'd meet at a post. Apocalypse. Yeah, I'd be slowly walking in a group stalking you. You'd be the only man alive that I could not resist. Then all of your friends, they try to 
kill us, but only because they'd be jealous that our love is deeper than Edward and Bella. Oh, if I were a zombie, I'd never eat your brain. I just want your heart, yeah, I want your heart, I just want your heart. Be hiding in a second floor apartment, knocking all the stairs down to save your life from the undead. Double barrel shotgun, taking out the slow ones, then you'd see the passion burning in my eye, and I'd keep my head. Then all of your friends, they'd try to kill us, but only because they'd be jealous that our love is deeper than Edward and Bella. I've got um, one more story for you lined up. It's Bloody Mary. I thought I'd save a a, a well-known story uh, for last. Uh, and, you know, I almost did something, and I wish I would have now, uh, on the Bell Witch, because she's local. The Bell Witch, actually, the site is actually maybe 15, 20 minutes from my house. So it's, it's pretty cool. There's lots of Bell Witch stories around here and things like that. And... I don't know. Maybe that's something I could just do later on, just for the hell of it. So we'll we'll see how that goes. Now I did um, uh, my version of the uh, Telltale Heart, and if you'd like to hear that, then I, I need some tweets. Uh, and you've got approximately three minutes and fifty three seconds to convince me. She lived deep in the forest in a tiny cottage and sold herbal remedies for a living. Folks living in the town nearby called her Bloody Mary and said she was a witch. None dared cross the old crone for fear that their cows would go dry, their food stores rot away before winter, their children take sick of fever, or any number of terrible things that an angry witch could do to her neighbors. Then the little girls in the village began to disappear, one by one. No one could find out where they had gone. Grief-stricken families searched the woods, the local buildings, and all the houses and barns but there was no sign of the missing girls. A few brave souls even went to Bloody Mary's home in the woods to see if the witch had taken the girls, but she denied any knowledge of the disappearance. Still, it was noted that her haggard appearance had changed. She looked younger, more attractive. The neighbors were suspicious, but they could not find proof that the witch had taken their young ones. Then came the night when the daughter of the miller rose from her bed and walked outside following an enchanted sound no one else could hear. The miller's wife had a toothache and was sitting up in the kitchen treating the tooth with an herbal remedy when her daughter left the house. She screamed for her husband and followed the girl out the door. The miller came running in his nightshirt. Together they tried to restrain the girl, but she kept breaking away from them and heading out of town. The desperate cries of the miller and his wife woke the neighbors. They came to assist the frantic couple. Suddenly, a sharp-eyed farmer gave a shout and pointed toward a strange light at the edge of the woods. 
A few townsmen followed him out into the field and saw Bloody Mary standing beside a large oak tree, holding a magic wand that was pointed toward the miller's house. She was glowing with an unearthly light as she set her evil spell upon the miller's daughter. The townsmen grabbed their guns and their pitchforks and ran toward the witch. When she heard the commotion, Bloody Mary broke off her spell and fled back into the woods. The far-sighted farmer had loaded his gun with silver bullets in case the witch ever came back after his daughter. Now he took aim and shot at her. The bullet hit Bloody Mary in the hip and she fell to the ground. The angry townspeople leapt upon her and carried her back into the field, where they built a huge bonfire and burned her at the stake. As she burned, Bloody Mary screamed a curse at the villagers. If anyone mentioned her name aloud before a mirror, she would send her spirit to revenge herself upon them for her terrible death. When she was dead, the villagers went to the house in the wood and found the unmarked graves of the little girls the evil witch had murdered. She had used their blood to make her young again. From that day to this, anyone foolish enough to chant Bloody Mary's name three times before a darkened mirror will summon the vengeful spirit of the witch. It is said that she will tear the bodies to pieces and rip their souls from their mutilated bodies. The souls of these unfortunate ones will burn in torment as Bloody Mary once burned herself, and they will be trapped forever in the mirror. Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary. Been a Chris Top production. <laughs> you can either take in the Chris Top program. You know, if you um, if you want to see a or read about a true artist, uh, someone that uh, is actually, I'm not going to say cool, just because it wouldn't be right. Uh, who is on the verge of being cool? That would be Clinton. He, he posted an article on my page, on my Facebook page. Uh, do yourself a favor and go check that out. Uh, but it's really cool when uh, somebody that I know gets noticed when they're, when they're doing something that they love. Uh, so congratulate, congratulations on that, Clinton. It's really cool. And uh, Telltale Heart, will we or will we not play that for you today? Well, we'll decide here in uh, about a minute. I sense a disturbance in the force. The dork side is strong in this one. Did you hear that? This is madness. We're doomed. Yoda, I don't think I can go back to Spreaker. Always with you. It cannot be done. Well, no, I think I could do it. I just don't know if I'm ready. You know nothing that I say. Wait, what? Can you just not talk Yoda for a minute? You must unlearn what you have learned. Okay, dude, you totally don't make any sense. If I unlearn what I've learned, there's no way I can do it. Okay, never mind. I'll try. No. You don't want me to try? Try not. Take it from the side. Do or do not. There is no try. You are such a motivational speaker. You, you really are. I do believe they think I am some sort of god. You can either take in the crypt You know, this has got to be the favorite uh, tweet that I got. Uh, you're excruciating. Please stop. I think that means, ladies and gentlemen, it is actually time for the Telltale Heart, Edgar Allan Poe. And I think I'm going to end this, the, uh, the show with this today. We'll do this, we'll play the outro, and then it's over. It's over. Happy Halloween to everybody. <laughs> Until I broadcast again, please remember this. Uh, see, there's a lot more. That, this is a long story. Okay, this is really long. So this is going to be the longest outro to a show you've ever heard in your whole entire life. So go ahead and get comfy. Just have a seat, because we'll be here just a little while longer, I promise you. Until I broadcast again, please remember this. Life is good. In the next show that I do, I, I, I know I'm stalling. Hang on. The next show that I do will be a normal, typical Chris Top program. When I'm going to do it, I have no clue just because my life is a whirlwind right now. It's crazy. I wish I could tell you guys how busy I am. I, I just I can't. But it's insane. 
I'm, I'm hoping I'll get a chance this weekend. We'll see how it goes. And see, I love spending time with you. I love jumping on the air and talking to you guys and, and hanging out and, and, and doing what I love to do. It's, it's so much fun. Uh, so I'm going to try my hardest to be here at least this weekend. And I'm hoping eventually things sort of level out a little bit. But, but we'll see how it goes. It's just, my, my life's in a tipsy-turvy. And I don't use that phrase every day. Until I broadcast again. Oh, oh, wait a minute. See? Oh, I can't do that yet. What am I thinking? Oh, hang on. I got to pull something up. Because I'm, I'm losing my touch. I am. I'm loose, losing my touch. Um, okay. So before I sign out, I have to do this. Uh, all the dorks that are listening, please stand to your feet. Raise your hand into the air. Put your other hand over your heart, and I want you to say this. I want you to say, I'm a dork, I'm proud, and I'm hip. Because this is the Dork National Anthem by my good buddy, Belgium Tim. Being awesome every day. I'm working on being awesome every day. Also have the Waba Rap by my good buddy Big N. Yeah, Big N in the building, representing the Dorks. Dorks, the world unite, y'all. Yeah. Hey, the everybody, I got something to say. This guy ride over there is Waba every single day. Okay, what is Waba eating? No, I do. It's just a little dork singing. Well, W was working, no was on it, B is being. And A is for awesome, and that's the dork singing. I'm already awesome, but that's okay. Cause Mr. Chris Top is too, but he just doesn't know where. And so know. are all of you from here on to the on far. And just so you know, life is good and I'm gone. 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 Just so you know, those of you that are listening now live, those of you that will go back and listen later, I do not, nor will I ever take any of you for granted, because there are a million other things you could be doing, but what do you do? You choose to listen to me, and that makes me feel good. It really does. Until I broadcast again, please remember this. Life is good, and I'm gone. True. Nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous. I have been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease has sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. But all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthy, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how far the idea entered my brain. But once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none. Passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man. And 
thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Mad men know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen me how wisely I proceeded. With what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night about midnight I turned the latch on his door and opened it. And so gently. And then when I had made an opening, sufficient for my head, I, I put in a dark lantern. All closed, closed, so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening, so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. <laughs> Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously. Cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture's eye. And this I did for seven long nights. Every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him. Calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve... I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute had moved more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door, little by little. And he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with a thick darkness, for the shutters were closed fastened through the fear of robbers, and so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing on it steadily. Steadily. I had my head in. I was about to open the lantern. When my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, the old man sprang up in bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quiet, still, and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening just as I have done night after night, hearkening to the death watches on the wall. Presently I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or grief, oh no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night... Just at midnight, when all the world slept, it, it was welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I, I knew what the old man felt. I pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew what he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise. When he had turned in the bed, his fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them cautiousness but could not. He had been saying to himself, it's nothing but the wind in the chimney. It's only a mouse crossing the floor. It's merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. 
Yes, he'd been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain. All in vain, because death is approaching him. Had stalked with his back shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he never saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it, and you cannot imagine how stealthily, how stealthily, until, at length, a single dim ray, like the thread of the spider, shot out of the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I, I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness. All the dull blue, which, with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very morrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person. For I directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon the damn spot. And I have not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of the senses. Now, I say there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder. I say louder every moment. Do you mark me well? Have I told you that I am nervous? So I am. And now at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house... So strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still, but the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor, and I pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done, but for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon his heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited it all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot, whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had called all. <laughs> Then I made an end of these labors. It was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour there, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart. For what had I no fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as, as officers of the police. 
A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled. For what had I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest for their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which I, which I reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. They had ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. <clears throat> I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and again definiteness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased. And, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles in a, in a high key with, with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what, what could I do? I, I foamed, I raved, I swore, I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting, and I grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no. No, they heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think. But anything was better than that agony. Anything was more tolerable than that derision. I could not bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, hark louder, louder, louder. Villains, I shrieked. Dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here, it is the beating of his hideous heart.
Everybody, I got something to say. This guy ride over there with Wabba every single day. Okay, what is Wabba eating? No, I do. It's just a little dog singing. Well, W is working, no one's on it, B is being. And A is for awesome, and that's the dog singing. I'm already awesome, but that's okay. Cause Mr. Chris Top is too, but he just doesn't know where. And so are all of you from here on to the on far. And just so you know, life is good, and I'm gone. Gone. Um, is it over yet? Completely over. You have been exposed to the Chris Top program. Yeah, okay, are we done? I I really gotta get a life. And in case you listen to the show all the time, you know I never truly leave after I play the outro. I always come back, at least just for a moment. And, uh... I just want to come back and tell you guys that I would love it uh, if you ever have the chance to uh, tumble with me. That's something I'm trying to get off the ground, my Tumblr. Uh, Also, uh, you know, um, pretty recently ago, uh, a lot of my stuff was uh, was erased. Uh, It was it was hacked into and and erased, and I I had um, uh, pretty close to 2,000 followers on my Facebook page, and now we're up to 125, baby. I'm making the comeback. It took me three years to get that many. See, it didn't happen overnight, people. It really didn't. Uh, but I'm I'm making a uh, slow and steady comeback. But it's cool <coughs> because these are people that that really enjoy the show and appreciate the show, and they don't like it and unlike it. They they usually like it and they stick around. So that's good. I've got a good solid base that I'm working with here. So if you'd help me out and just uh, check out uh, the Facebook page, the Tumblr page, of course, follow me on Spreaker, uh, phone zoo, tweet with me, uh, all these things that you can do. I know I ask a lot of you. I know. I do. And, and what do I give you in return? I give you my soul. I give you my body. Just please. I'm just I'm kidding. If you want to do it, do it. But if you don't, that's okay, too. Um, oh, oh, and I want to mention one more thing, too. There's actually a competition going on on Spreaker right now. Oh, and the podcast awards, I have no idea. Like I said, it was a snowball's chance in hell that I was even going to get nominated. So so we'll see how that goes. We should know something in the next uh, week or so on that. Uh, I'll let you know either way. Uh, more than likely, it's going to be a, a big fat negative. <laughs> but, but we tried, and that's all we can do is try. Uh, but on my page, I shared a picture of myself. That is on the uh, the Spreaker Facebook page. If you would click on that link and go to Spreaker and make sure you vote for me, because I could win six months of Spreaker for free, and that's always cool. That's like a hundred and twenty dollars savings. So if if I could get some votes on that, that would be really really neat. So if you if you have the time to do that for me, I'd appreciate it. Just go to my Facebook page, scroll down a little bit, and you'll see a uh, picture of my big fat head, uh, and I I'm. I'm just I'm talking into the microphone. I'm I'm screaming there's passion feeding into the microphone. But if you could like that for me and share it on your page and tell your friends to like it, uh it would be very helpful. And uh it it's not the podcast awards, but still it's it would be pretty cool uh, if I had a chance to win that. Uh but anyway, I do want to thank everybody that uh that hung around to the very end in the chat. We've got uh my sister from another Miss Miss Kimberly Toppin here. We have the lovely vivacious kiss in the chat. We've also got the the Reverend Wayne uh, Pierce, but he actually goes by the Views Express now. Reverend, it's good to hear you. You um, are actually late. I, I I've actually already ended the show, but if you want some Halloween stories to listen to, I'd appreciate it, and some music and some other lively camaraderie. Then you can go back and check it out. Uh, it's only 80 minutes long. Well, the more I talk, the longer it gets, of course, so I'll shut up. Uh, But you guys have a wonderful Halloween, and I hope to see you very, very soon. Maybe as early as this Friday, Saturday, somewhere in there. We'll shoot for Friday, and and hopefully we'll get lucky, and maybe Saturday will work out. But like I said, I'm I'm spread pretty thin these days, and I, I try my hardest to get on here. I really do, but life happens, and you have to take care of responsibilities and do things. 
Um, but this is my love, and this is my passion, and I will continue to, to do this as much as I possibly can. I promise you that. Until I broadcast again, please remember, life is good, and I'm gone. I am the one and only so Chris Top, self-proclaimed leader done that of all dorks. Let me try that again. I'm Chris Life Top, is good. king of the dorks. That's right. Yeah, I remember growing <laughs> up I, those. I yeah. am the one and only Chris Top, self-proclaimed leader of all dorks. I'm Chris Top, king of the dorks. That's right. Yeah, I remember growing up when I was a little kid, my mom was so sweet. She would say things like, thank God, Chris, there's only one of you because you are so, so very special. There is only one Easter Bunny, there's only one Jesus Christ, there's only one God, and there's only one Chris Top. I am the one and only Chris Top, broadcasting live from my lavish studio apartment here in sunny Clarksville, Tennessee, with... An ocean view. Actually, that that's not true. I, I I live next to a dumpster. Meow. Shut up, Abby. Keep quiet. Yes, I know. I don't really have an ocean view. I have a view of the local hobo singing around a burning dumpster. But I don't want my fans to know that. <laughs> hmm. Does Chris Top have a mysterious side, a darker side, if you will? Well, I guess I do. You could compare my life to the Da Vinci Code. C for Chris Top. H for Holy Mackerel, it's Chris Top. Well, I don't know if my show would make sense if you played it backwards, but I do have a few things right in front of your face. R for Really Awesome, Chris Top. I for I Can't Believe, it's Chris Top. S for Somebody Pinch Me, it's Chris Top. Am I conceited? Am I conceited? No, I'm not. D for Terrific, Chris Top. O as in Oh My God, it's Chris Top. And P for party time with me, Chris Top. <laughs> oh, God. Well, the ladies do like their Chris Top. <laughs> oh, God. Well, that's it for today, folks. I'll see you tomorrow. Until then, life is good. And I'm gone.